So, <laughs> the topic I find really interesting is one that I've been working on for a long time, the interface between biodiversity and agriculture. And so um, I thought it was a good opportunity to kind of really underline here how much biodiversity is absolutely critical to agriculture. And in return, agriculture should respect that and foster biodiversity. So uh, perhaps I'm speaking more to the first point, biodiversity underpins agriculture. So we go to the next one. So I often begin presentations with the next one, with sort of talking about all the problems that we have. So, yeah, so it's several different places here, because some of that's on top of it, if you go ahead. Yeah. So the food system today, I mean, I, I don't want to do that right now, because I think we, we know this quite well. Uh, so there's several. Yeah, we, we know about monoculture, agriculture, uh, we're certainly becoming more and more aware of all of the, the food waste, the fact that we put, a, put so many resources into producing food that then goes to waste, which could be a, a real conservation of, of food and resources. Um, the fact, the shocking facts of how much malnutrition and hunger we have in the world today, and, and that's all, that's uh, not showing in, in, in Asia, Africa, Latin America, there still is a surprising amount of malnourishment in North America as well. And, and just more evidence that the food system is not delivering what we need. The extent of the population that is either overweight or obese, and the cost that that has in terms of roughly the same economic impact as smoking or armed conflict. And as I said, I don't really want to go into any, I'm not going to dwell on it, I'm going rather quickly because this is usually what we start with, but I really want to go to more what solutions are and what the, what the positive aspects are. Climate change's impact on from industrial agriculture, which is now rated at, at somewhere between 44 and 57 percent of greenhouse gas emissions, is huge. But on the other side, biodiversity is a real uh, cause of receiving a lot of impacts, but it's also a source of a lot of solutions to many of these problems. Just understanding how much. Biodiversity underpins agriculture. The fact that there's so many, so much diversity just in a handful of soil. Uh, that every third bite you eat depends on pollinators. With no pollinators, you will have miserable little strawberries like the one on the right, versus a really delicious strawberry like the one on the left. And a recognition that local and indigenous varieties of foods have can kind of up to a thousand times the nutrient content of more than the variety. Those are just a few points. How important biodiversity is. So I want to sort of speak a little bit about my own journey. For me, it really began with an understanding around pollination. Um, so I can speak to this on, on a sort of a global scale because I coordinated the international work, the International Pollinator Initiative at the Food and Agriculture Organization for many years. And uh, we, we could work in, um, we had support for a global project in uh, Brazil, Kenya, Ghana, South Africa, India, Pakistan, and Nepal, and then the Norwegian government helped us spread that to Colombia, Argentina, Zimbabwe, Indonesia, and China. So we had a global project where we could really work with farmers and farming communities in many countries on understanding the importance of pollination and what they might be able to do to keep the pollinators in their system. And um, it was it was a really for me, it was an absolutely fascinating project, and a lot of it was from understanding the, the innovations that the farmers have in the local communities. Once, many of them did not know the importance of pollination as farmers everywhere have not known until it's become a crisis and we start to lose it. But once they understood it, their ideas about what could be done were really, really innovative. Um, uh, just give an example in, in Ghana, where farmers grow a lot of Crops that are dependent on pollinators, like um, chili pepper, is one example. Chili pepper, tomatoes, and we talk to them a lot about you know what's being um, piloted in, say, in California. In many places, the idea of hedgerows around farms to keep pollinators attractive. Chili pepper is a crop that is um, not very attractive to pollinators. It only produces pollen and not nectar, so they will go there, but a little bit reluctantly. So um, we mentioned the idea. Of Hedgerows and the farmer said, you know, are you crazy? We have these small fields. We can't allocate some land to, to just simply decorative flowering plants to bring the pollinators in. But our farmers in Ghana said they realized that cassava, which is a root crop, um, it isn't dependent on pollinators itself, but it has flowers that are very attractive to pollinators. So they innovated with the idea of putting a hedgerow, uh, so to speak, of, of cassava around their chili pepper fields, which would really draw in the, 
the pollinators to the, that's a, a cassava flower, and then, then they would go on to the chili peppers. So for all the farmers at the end of this, this um, project, which I'll speak about a little bit later as well, but for all the farmers could be just immensely creative to support pollinators, I think myself and our colleagues around the world, we really concluded at the end of this time that we had not been able to save pollinators that no single practice, such as hedgerows or flowering strips, will save pollinators. It's not just in individual practices, it's really the farming system. The fact that we have farming systems which are leading farmers in the direction of using increasingly more agricultural inputs, increasingly more pesticides. As long as you have a flowering strip and you spray the, the pollinators with pesticides, you're really not going to, you're not going to get from that. And it's, moreover, it's the whole system. Farmers don't ever manage for one individual thing, they're managing all together. That, that, they're, they're, that we deal more with the system level of how you approach a more sustainable ecological agriculture. So within, um, within the Food and Agriculture Organization, where I was working at the time, we had a director general who was from Brazil, and he really understood agroecology. Uh, we previously really, I think wouldn't go in that direction, but he opened up the door for us to go in that direction. And he, he himself said, the present paradigm of intensive crop production cannot be the challenges of the new millennium. And we really need a transformation for the future of agriculture in which the way it's conducted and how it impacts on the environment. By the way, if there's any questions along the line, I mean, I'm really, I, I think there's time not just at the end, but there would be time if anybody has any comment or questions. Yeah, Okay. So this is the, the concept of the whole system transformation. This is when we were able to have a, start talking about agroecology at FAO and we had a Symposium in 2014 and a follow-up in 2018. That was an artist that I, I really favor at FAO who helped draw a graphic for us, which I, I absolutely love. It's very dreamy, and I think it kind of is how we need to think outside the box as well in agroecology. It has a, a bee that's bigger than the cow, <laughs> and a fish that's swimming underneath the maze. And the tractor's tiny. Yeah, and, but there is a tractor. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> the one pushing the tractor. Yeah. <laughs> so, in the end, I think it's the realization we need to make is that productive sectors in every country, in every region of the world, can be designed to build upon and harness the forces of biodiversity. And here, in this this presentation, I want to consider just a few aspects. This is not all inclusive; it doesn't cover all of the areas. But some areas that I would like to touch on would be. Diets, food security and biodiversity, resilience to climate change, livelihoods and biodiversity, pest control and biodiversity, and pollination. I'll touch on some of the things that have been part of my work. I think. So in terms of diet, food security, and biodiversity, I mean, we know that over the last 50 years, our global diet has shifted tremendously to include a greater amount of major oil crops and lesser quantities of regionally important staples. So that soybeans, sunflower, and palm oil are a much larger portion of our diet. Uh, and we've lost many of the, the more regionally important aspects, many of them root crops, cassava, sweet potato, and some of the, the other grains, which may have somehow has taken over from. <clears throat> so a shift to diets that are much more diverse, higher in coarse grains, pulses, fruits, vegetables, and nuts also has many benefits for the global environment, uh, including greenhouse gas emissions. And then in addition, a number of, of studies lately has been showing that farms, that on-farm diversity has linked to greater dietary diversity, less poverty, and malnutrition. Um, this is, FAO has been featuring sort of traditional agricultural sites. So this, these are just two pictures from the agricultural heritage site in Yunnan, China. And in many of these, these sites, it's very good documentation of the on-farm biodiversity linking to much greater diet diversity. <coughs> Um, in addition, it's been shown that sort of landscape diversity in diets, this very comprehensive survey that was done across Africa that showed a significant positive relationship between tree cover and dietary diversity. So fruit and vegetable consumption increased with tree cover and uh, child malnutrition was less where, where children had more access to fruit and vegetable consumption. And it's documented that much of this comes from wild, not cultivated biodiversity. It's estimated that globally 50% of all fruit consumed by humans originate from trees in wild or semi-wild stands in the native forest, which is really a lot. <clears throat> um, 
And then as well at farm levels, wild biodiversity often forms a, a sort of safety net for periods of food shortage. This was from uh, Rabu, Ravi Prabhu's presentation at our first agroecology symposium with work that was done in Machakos, Kenya, in the arid regions of, of Kenya, where uh, the researchers at, at the International Agroforestry Center had shown the consumption of different uh, fruits throughout the year and showing, if just to understand this a little bit, on the right, uh, the hunger season is a special box and showing uh, the fruits that are harvested during that time, which is really at a different time than when crops are coming. It's a hungry season because it's outside of the harvest period of the crops. But the trees generally have a very different phenology. They tend to fruit in the, the time when the crops are not fruiting. So the importance of, the, um, of many of these species of trees for vitamin C, vitamin A, and just generally addressing the, the hunger season is sort of illustrates how important this is as a safety net. <clears throat> and then in terms of resilience in biodiversity, um, the, the degree to which highly diverse landscapes can really be a protection against many aspects of, of climate change. So this was work done by Eric conventional farms and the number of mudslides which occurred afterwards. So uh, the enhanced resilience was more pronounced with increasing levels of storm intensity, slope, and number of years under diversified farming practices. Uh, livelihoods and biodiversity. This is um, across the globe. This is a study that was just completed by a good colleague of mine, Lucas Garibaldi in Argentina. He's also done a lot of work in pollination. And he has now expanded into more sort of looking at, at uh, ecological agriculture altogether, and he, he's a fantastic number cruncher, so just delves into statistics, and he's been able to document that across the globe, countries with higher crop diversity support more agricultural employment and do not sacrifice socioeconomic development or economic growth. And this really is, a, I think it's a really important finding, and it really flies in the face of the sense that, you know, if we're to have agricultural, if we're to have economic development, prosperity, we must give up this idea of diversified really, really not the case. And I think there's other, there's other pieces of evidence that I'll, I'll come back to on this. So pest control and biodiversity. Um, this is a, an illustration of a shift to what should be a total system approach to pest management, rather than using heavy reliance on pesticides. A pesticide treadmill, which we know just keeps, keeps repeating itself and driving us to use more and more the sense of working up through an ecosystem approach. If you need to use therapeutics as a backup, this was this is an old study, but one of the best illustrating the whole picture in 1997. You know, really asking that we go to total system management. Um, I think one of the best illustrations of this is from a colleague of mine who was at FAO, and he was also a graduate here from UC Davis um, in ecology, Bill Settle on pest control and biodiversity in rice in Indonesia, which is, rice is an incredible system from the standpoint of biodiversity. It is because it is, because water in the system is sort of thing, and it's able to attract an incredible number of organisms of all sorts. And um, it, some rice paddies have been shown to have a higher biodiversity than the natural weapons. It's really just quite an amazing ecosystem. And what um, Bill and his colleagues in Indonesia were able to show was this mechanism in the irrigated systems that supports high levels of natural biological control. This is the proportion of different kinds of insects that were found in the rice paddies. And the um, herbivores, the ones which would be eating the rice, were 16 percent insects. But there were predators and parasitoids of these, these um, pests. Let's say the herbivores are the pest. In addition, there's the detrivores and the plankton feeders. So what he was able to show was that in a rice paddy, there's a fair amount of material which simply degenerates from the previous year at the bottom of the rice paddy. And there are these insects which come in and eat, eat on that material, aquatic insects. And the predators and parasitoids, parasitoids need to build up their population early in the season. They don't have to have step. It has come a bit later. But they need to build up their population early. And then they're there in strong numbers to really um, control the insect. And that is completely destroyed if you use insecticides. You've, you've eliminated the, the insects that build up the other insects to exert a natural internal control. 
I think that's a, a really excellent example. Um, you can see the state for, for this is also 1997. A lot of the key work in biological control was really quite some time ago. And um, so my husband, who's here, he, uh, he ran the largest biological control program in the world in Africa. Um, and then we both met at the Division of the Biological Control at UC Berkeley, which doesn't exist anymore. And it's, it's really unfortunate that somehow we, we had these insights, we had these breakthroughs, and yet universities are not supporting it to continue with, with biological control. Is that a supply? Right, UC Davis, which is run by Monsanto. That's right. <laughs> I would just mention, so this has been another very coach that was involved in the pest control and biodiversity, the, this really, really appealing system in, in, in Africa, uh, the push-pull system, which operates off of, um, it's a system of controlling pests in maize. So it was realized that that plants are communicating with insects all the time. They're issuing pheromones that attract or, or, or uh, repel insects. So using this characteristic of plants, it's possible to attract natural enemies into the crop plant. Uh, this is through desmodium legume that's interplanted among the bays. To um, the desmodium as well pushes the moths, which is the, the pest that we're dealing with here, pushes them away. And that by putting a trap crop around the maze, the moths can be attracted into the trap crop. And uh, this was at ICIPA, the International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology in Kenya. Um, it's, they've gone on to understand that a lot of the land races of maize, bred by the complex themselves, have this ability to attract uh, the, the natural enemies or to repel the natural enemies, but that the highly bred hybrid maize has lost its ability, which is interesting. Um, They've continued to apply this to other crops as well, like sorghum and um, rice. Rice, yeah. So it has a lot of, a lot of, um, really a lot of interest. It has at least one system of plants. You see them. Okay. So then on pollination, I just uh, didn't want to step on on uh, Claire's presentation, but I would just mention that um, that in many respects we on the global level, I could say that, uh, say within the Convention on Biodiversity, often agriculture is seen as the enemy of biodiversity. And for good reason. I mean, they, when they attribute losses of biodiversity, they attribute, say, 70% of the losses that we're experiencing now due to conventional agriculture. But the other flip side of that is that agriculture does not need to be the enemy of biodiversity. And with, I think pollination is a, a good example of this. This was work done by my colleague Mary Kakungu in Kenya where she showed, this was outside of Kakumega Forest, a very beautiful forest in western Kenya, where she showed that, um, that there was a greater richness of bees in the agricultural environment over the secondary and even mature forest environment, just next to the field. And this is an area where people don't use a lot of pesticides. If you have fields, small fields, diverse fields that are full of sun and uh, flowers, it's actually very friendly to bees. So she found really quite a number of rare bees, even in this environment. And a similar study was done in New Jersey, sorry, showing something similar. So this is where I just talked a little bit about some interaction we had at FAO with, with pollination. Through this global pollination project in the government of Norway, we did develop a protocol to assess when a crop is suffering from a deficit, suffering a deficit in yield from a lack of pollinators. So we were able to apply this deficit throughout the, all of the sites that's, that are noted here. Um, so it was 344 fields, 33 different crop systems over a five-year period. It was a very, very large and robust study. And again, my colleague, Lucas Garibaldi, who is a, um, he really loves meta-analysis to bring this all together, to bring all the researchers together um, so that you end up with a, a result that is much more than what you found in 33 crop systems. It's a really shows that they can show significant trends. And the crop fields were from small holdings to large holdings. So it spanned quite a, quite a range. In, in Brazil and China, we were in really large holdings, most of them were small holdings. The findings were, in the small holdings, for fields less than two hectares, the yield gap 
could be closed by a medium of 24% of higher pollination visitation. Um, addressing 24% of the yield gap is really tremendous. I mean, that is something that we seek the miracle fertilizer or seed to do, and that's, that's really significant. That means that the farmer understands the importance of pollination and is deliberately managing it. Um, for the large holdings, it, wasn't, it was more complicated than that. Uh, the benefits only occurred at higher, higher flower visitor richness, which means the larger holdings really needed the diversity. They needed the hedgerows. You know, they need to break up, break up the fields in some way that bring the pollinators into these large fields. Um, and worldwide, it demonstrates that through ecological intensification, we can create both benefits for biodiversity and for yields as well. So the, I just kind of want to end with, I've gone through these different aspects of biodiversity and agriculture and how they mix. I just want to address this question, which we almost always come to, is who is producing our food and why does biodiversity and farm size matter? matter? So this is a, a graph that's been put together by um, Pablo Titamel, and I was fun that he puts information together in a really interesting way. So if you look at this, if you look at the dotted line at 50% of our food production, all of the countries above that are, this is Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Central America, Australia, India, Turkey, right, Ukraine is just below the line, but yeah. But those, that group of countries is producing 50% of our food. And, the country, and they are producing it with really small uh, yields, uh, mm -hmm. 3.1 tons per hectare, average productivity. The countries which have really massive productivity over to the right, above 6 to, six to 12, well, 6 to 11, um, are producing 12.5% of total food productivity. So who is producing the food? Uh, majority of the food. So industrial agriculture, in that 12.5%, consumes most of the energy, water, and nutrient inputs available at the global level, pushing international price levels to levels that make them prohibitive for smaller farmers in the South. So if developed country industrial agriculture is not going to feed the world, who is? So this is a, um, a graph from a paper by Herrero et al. in 2017. And um, it's, I like it very much, but I find it very confusing. So I tried to make it simpler for you a little bit. So this is showing um, the size of farms. I think you can see the legend over on the right. So if you think about this, it's the purple, the blue, and the green, which are very small, small and medium size. So if you look on this, this graph, in many of the areas, it's really small. It's those first three that really count a lot. There are certain ones where it's really the large farms. That would be, I, I take those off so you have a chance to, to be able to see where the small farms very small, small and medium sized are really critical. And yeah, I think it's, I think then you go down to the world map. And that is a pretty good indication of where, where we're, um, sorry. Well, there was more of a legend on here, but where, where our food is being produced currently. So these are the, the farms which actually receive I would say, um, being at, at the Food and Agriculture of the United Nations, the trend among a lot of dialogue is support the larger farmers go in this larger direction. I mean, this is, the, the, the agroecology is running counter that, but there is another dialogue saying, get big or get out. But this is where the food is being produced right now. They're not receiving the, the commensurate amount of attention. It's primarily these that are the most substantial contributors to the world's food supply, and they're also located where there's the greatest food insecurity. And they have the, tend to have the lowest average yields. So it would make sense to focus on this category of farms in addressing gaps in food security. The same report then also looked at how the diversity of food production changes with the diversity of agricultural landscapes and production systems. So this is uh, the percentage of the world population, of the world production from diverse landscapes, which was a metric that they developed on the, the amount of crop diversity in any particular region, versus world production from non-diverse landscapes. So very high percentage for vegetables, roots and tubers, pulses, fruit, 
still over 50% for fish and livestock, even over 50% for cereals coming from diverse landscapes. Uh, then the contrary is, is true with um, sugar and oil crops on the far right. And then the synthesis for global micronutrients and proteins again shows the importance of diverse landscapes. So <clears throat> I think that's, that's, a, that's a good indication. So that's, it's the small scale diverse landscapes that are the engines of nutritious food production in the world and they're the ones that merit the greatest support in terms of investment in social capital, building a fair and equitable markets, and research on farming and food systems to serve local populations. Yet they receive little of this. So that's, mm -hmm. that's my opinion. Thank you very much, Barbara. Yeah, for very inspiring presentation. Yeah. Spell trichinelle for me. I couldn't see it. Yeah, any of those references I can I can share with you, but it's titonel. T i t t o n e. Yeah, and also we will share all slides, all recordings with everyone. So don't worry to write every single one. No, but I, I mean I always try to give a citation for whatever, yeah. um, and and so I don't. It's not there. I mm -hmm. would have to give a citation. Yeah, uh, someone asked to show the previous slide. <coughs> this one? Uh -huh. Yeah, I think that this one. It's online. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, so, uh, the, 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 yeah, please. Yeah, the, maybe a few, a couple of comments. In the one that I want to go, it's sort of interesting to see that the is appearing from biocontrol in, in many places, universities, but also in research centers, uh, comes at the time when biotechnology was coming up. And I remember when I was in, doing my work in Africa in biocontrol, when you, you used to go to national programs, look at their labs, the biotech lab, all the money there, Rockefeller, and all, they, they were equipped with every gadget you can think of. Then you go over to entomology, to the insect collection, there were broken windows, there was no light, they, I mean, it was a total disaster. And I think it, it, it really uh, hurts when you think that how far we went with back control and how it just fell off. Look at the CGI, International Ag Research Institution, there's hardly any back control going on anywhere. Where the biggest success for the whole system, even today, was this cassava minimum back control. Mm. So, just to say, so, so we have a problem here that something good has been taken over, by something which has done zero, basically, for increasing the, the access the, the, to food, the product, even the quantity, or uh, the, the diversity or quality, right? And, and millions and billions are spent in the wrong direction. So I think, you know, we need to wake up. From it. And the universities, and this one also, I think, needs to do more uh, in, in that direction, because I mean, it's the same thing. And okay, we don't even talk about it, because the whole bag on top, Part is gone, finished. Right? As you know, the drug doesn't exist anymore. Um, but um, the um, other thing about large large firms, Kenya has just last year, the last week last year, come up with a new uh, strategy for agriculture. Now, after all the training, all the ECP and CGI centers there, they go to Mackenzie to get a the strategy written. Funded by the Gates Foundation, the, the Agra program. What are they calling for? The expansion of large farms in Kenya. That's what the, the big thing is more large farms in Kenya. So, so, again, you know, we've got a problem somewhere here which we have to address. And the question, you know, chicken and egg situation, I think, is is the diversity on farm the result of the demand for more diverse food? Or, you know, how does it work? Because I think that if people would demand more diversity, farmers would produce more. But is it right the way it works? I mean, from Asia, I'm not so sure from the example you showed. No, I mean, I think the diversity on farmers is, this, these are how the systems are right now. They haven't, they haven't really changed all that much in many of those areas. But because of the demand. Oh, okay, so what you're saying. See what yeah, I mean? I mean what's yes. it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so what's yeah. Does that reflect in, in tech? traditions, cultural traditions of diversity as compared to monopolization and 
monetizing the market yeah. for export, which mm-hmm. has to be more simplified and more profitable on a larger scale. It, it does seem to reflect the fact that, that people um, are producing for local demand and for local markets, but it, and they're the ones who are producing most of the food. So that is, that's a, a huge strength. You know, we shouldn't try to say that's wrong. That would be something to really build, would be more effort on building. I mean, local markets do have a lot of challenges. There's a lot of um, food waste that occurs in markets. You know, there's a lot of issues with, with being able to, to preserve food. So it, that could be really strengthened, realizing that, yeah, this is a real advantage. There's so much about the system that we should not take apart. We should build on that. Well, maybe we should pass also to online presenters. So, uh, Jorge, I wanted to ask the question. So, if you can unmute yourself and ask. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm Jorge coming from Mexico City. Thank you so much for following this event online. Uh, I have an original question, but I think that one was answered already by the, the conversation that you just had in the venue. Uh, but then I would change my question to, um, it seems to me that it might be worth analyzing the economical system rather than the food producing system, because as you have uh, answered before my question, you're saying that all of these small scale farmers are mainly for self-consumption purposes or for local distribution of the produce. <clears throat> so I think that that goes against the economic system worldwide. So is it worth having like a transactional conversation about economy and agriculture to find pathways forward? I, I can just give a, a, an initial response, I'm sure people have other, other thoughts, but no, I, I completely agree with you, and I think that the way that we um, embrace an economic system has a lot to do with the situation we find ourselves in, that we need to have different metrics on that economic system. So I know that um, someone in people work in agroforestry must know this fairly well. There's a number of studies that really show that you know, having trees on farm may mean that you have less yield, if it's simply an economic yield, but an increase in livelihoods, an increase in being able to address the hunger season or being able to, and for farmers in, in North America as well, there's many benefits in the tree that are not captured necessarily in the economic system. And if our only metric is yield, we really run up against, uh, you know, we're flying in the face of that and not respecting it. Um, and it, in it, I mean, there's many other aspects that, where that pertains to North American agriculture. You know, we're not addressing the negative externalities of corn and soy in the Midwest and all of the nitrates that go into drinking water, which then water works need to pay large sums of money to, to take out. Who's paying for it? It's it's the consumers. Um, so, I, you know, I totally agree. And that's another area that I have been working on and, and find really appealing, this idea of true cost accounting in agriculture as as a mechanism. We really need to, the, the UN has been addressing that to some extent, um, but we really need to get governments engaged on it because governments need to make that level playing field. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you very much. This is uh, fascinating for me. I, I come from Botswana and our government in the last two, three years is really shifting towards large farms, is encouraging people to, to actually move away from diversification in the smaller farms. Because small farms traditionally have meant substance, uh, subsistence farming. So you and your family and your neighbors. So government argues increasingly that that is not sufficient for food security of the whole nation. So it's actually encouraging people next to each other to bring down the fences so that they can farm in a large scale. And most of this is sub- subsidized by the government itself. So they're bringing huge machinery or either maize or sorghum or beans at a very large scale. So it's, it's very interesting that this presentation is really against that kind of thinking. And there's a lot of thinking 
at home about how do we bring in either pesticides or to treat termites and so on. So it's, it's all at a large scale because large is considered commercial. Smaller is thought to be subsistence. So I don't know how in your work, um, because you have quite a long history working on this, how you could convince states that actually you can have a, a commercial at a smaller scale, as it were, in diverse scale. I think that's an excellent point. And I think, you know, the, the thing that really does catch policymakers by surprise, I think, is this idea of employment. Yes. Every, every politician wants to see high employment. Yes. The idea that, that having more diversity among farms and smaller farms leads to greater employment is they haven't they evidently haven't read that paper. And I think that's something that we really need to, yeah. to be and, and we should probably stop talking, you know, so much always about subsistence, as if this is really a return to the old days yes. everything is done by hand labor and, and you know, this sort of thing. It's it is Small farms are commercial farms. Generally, in, in most areas, they're selling some at least of what they're what they're producing. And uh, as we say, we could strengthen local markets and not not pay to this being you know, returned to the past. It's really a future. Yeah. Do you want to facilitate? Uh, oh, yeah. well, if you were to count the BTUs using a small farm, it would be far smaller per bushel of production than what's used in the big farms with their subsidies. So when you get a subsidy in the system, I'm not saying taking them away, because we're addicted, we can't cope without them. But there has to be a transition in, in a plan to get away from those subsidies. Because the most efficient use of oil, which is a limited resource, is to have the smaller oil. Um, I was just wondering, um, if you somehow address that what percentage of the pollination is done by native pollinators as opposed to commercial mm -hmm. uh, honeybees, mm -hmm. and that the native pollinators, a large percentage of them, are working very small distances, a few hundred feet. Right. And so, and they're all ground nesting, but again, a large percentage of them. And so, maybe that's part of the reason why a large farm. Um, doesn't provide habitat and the distance where they can travel. And if we could work hedgerows within large farms, so so if they're moving in that direction to share equipment, if there are some efficiencies that are gained by it, and if it's done based on the pollinator their lifestyle, then putting it in a grid system where you have more natural land within that area. And I, as a high beekeeper, um, attended a conference here in Davis on pollination. And um, it was, to my disappointment, they were just trying to find a way to make more money by selling, doing research on what seed plants to plant to attract the pollinators. So a farmer who's already doing everything commercial could buy this seed versus this seed versus this seed mix. And if they're not providing habitat, they're just giving them food. <laughs> and then they till it all up, so they're just killing them again. And when they found out after a lot of money in a few years time that uh, it didn't work too well, <laughs> so yeah, no, I didn't. I didn't go into that, but, right. um, but but you're right. I mean, the, the studies that have been done have shown how important the native pollinators are. That actually, you know, people like the almond growers really depend on hives coming in because you can manage it. Bring them in. But the native pollinators are responsible for more than fifty percent of the pollination. Um, yeah, so that's an important point. But again, farmers don't. If you if you're looking for a new kind of agriculture, the way that we need to transform, it wouldn't just be one thing. It wouldn't be just managing the pollinators. It would be the fact that having more more natural habitat in what they're calling nature and working lands now um, would be also preserving natural enemies and bringing in other aspects. And that that takes people. I don't think you can do that all just from a tractor. You know, I think you you then do need that sort of fine tuned management of land and being able to establish that diversity of restoring natural areas. The commission food waste in local um, markets. Is there are there any studies that you know of that focus on the difference between conventional farming food waste versus local market food waste? 
it's an interesting question. I, I know work that's been done looking at, at local markets and how they can, they can be worked with to decrease food waste. We don't think it's exactly comparative. That would be a, a, a It seems like there's a tremendous amount of conventional agriculture. Well, yeah, so that's food waste. Uh, food waste. Yeah, exactly. So that it would be a really interesting comparison. I don't know. I, I would really be very like the conventional agriculture because in the industrial ag, there's such an importance on co products. Right, like look like at corn, like every little bit has a use so they can make money on the marketing and different little things, so there's always co products. So, but then if you end up looking at a dumpster full of organic in yeah. jars, like two weeks before its sell by date, um, in dumpsters ready to go into the landfill, that's cool. But when we go back to where the organic, like small older farming happens, it's a lot yeah, I just think the processing technology complexifies things a little bit. So I'd be very curious to see. Yes, I mean, they do separate out in, in the food waste work, uh, they separate out uh, the food waste that goes on farm versus the post harvest food waste. And I, I mean, I have that, I have one graph that I just at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think another aspect of that is actually what, what amount of organic matter is actually going back into the Yeah. 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 Or getting smothered into the Like, how organic do they do and how the recycle does the waste steady, the waste potential, the highest thing is good. Yeah. And so that's just the residential level. So you, yeah, this no, that doesn't break it out sufficiently because it's production to retailing, and then and then consumer waste. But yeah, that would be really interesting. Okay. Yeah, so uh, yeah, we have one minute uh, to move to the next presenter. So I would like to thank Barbara for such a nice, nice opening of this uh, conference uh, session.